Why it took me 56 years to get to Portugal, I've got no idea. Been all around here. But I was here for the first time last year, now it's 57. Yeah, I know, I'm getting old, but I'm here, I'm here. I wanted to come back with cameras, I love this place. We're in the town of Matosinos, known for seafood. I've eaten sardines from this town since I was a baby. Seriously, now we're here, outside of restaurant La Gavetto. We're gonna meet the owner, see the food. Yeah, Portugal, we're in Portugal for the next half an hour. We're gonna do seafood, bacalao, Portuguese wines, port. Don't touch that dial. I'm Mike Colomeco, Industry Insider. I've been in the business my whole life and I know what it takes to succeed. Each week we'll take you into real kitchens, filmed in real time. Backstage passes to a day in the life of chefs, restaurateurs, and their teams. The competition's fierce. Careers, life savings, and reputations hang in the balance. These are my people, and this is their passion. And that's what's next on Mike Colomeco's Real Food. Mike Colomeco's Real Food is brought to you by the continuous, generous support of the following underwriters. Cola Vita, a true Italian. What goes into King Arthur flour can't be measured in a single cup. Thousands of recipes, plus products, and other baking resources are at kingarthurflour.com. From Welshire Farms comes Lou's Garrett Valley Naturals, a collection of our recipes made from minimal ingredients without added antibiotics, hormones, nitrates, nitrites, or artificial ingredients. Lou's Garrett Valley Naturals. A heritage preserved over centuries with passion, craftsmanship, and care. The flavor of European pork and beef. The taste of European tradition. Mancini, maker of American fire-roasted peppers. Imported from Italy, Anna Pasta is made from 100% Italian Durham wheat semolina and pure spring water, slowly dried to cook al dente. Recipes online at cento.com. This is our first day in the country, and customarily, I walk all day to fend off the jet lag. I'm really not good at taking naps. But all that walking made me hungry. So Matosinos, a city I've always wanted to visit, a seafood dinner, and my second chance to taste lamprey eel. You call it just crap, so. <laughs> so talk about the restaurant. 30 years here, you're just doing seafood. Mostly seafood and fish. <laughs> we are near the harbor. I was going to say, as we drove here, you yeah. could see the ocean at yes, the end of the street. True. Little mm -hmm. clams, olive oil. Olive oil and garlic. Nothing that's else. it, period, done, yeah. simple. I'm so happy to be in Matosinos, I have to tell you. I've known about this town on paper. Matosinos, I mean, I remember reading it on sardine cans when mm -hmm. I was a kid. Yeah. Matosinos, Mato Joe Coelho, Inter-Iberia Seafood, Matosinos, and now I'm here. Here. <laughs> Took 57 <laughs> years, but yeah, I'm here. And they are ready. Heaven. It's simple. And you know what? I love it with cilantro. I never thought of that. I always thought parsley, you know, usually parsley, butter, olive oil, lemon juice. Cilantro? Butter. Seriously? Look at this. We're fighting over bread. This is terrible. <laughs> that was mine. This is terrible. This was his. That's good. It's it like seagulls. <laughs> <laughs> so the lamprey eel is this crazy eel that attaches itself on yeah, the fish. It's not, technically, it's not a eel, but it's similar like It's a like eel. a vampire yeah, eel. It's a vampire eel, eel that eats the blood from the other fishes. When they come up the river, to put the eggs, we fish them. You you understand? It's like the salmon. Mm. They have one when they cycle. Run, right. Yeah, they have one cycle of life. When they come to the river to put the eggs, and then they die. So this is the lamprey eel. The first time I ever had it fresh, with the sauce thickened with its own blood. Rice. It's really good. It's really really good. I love eel. Eel is the oxtail of fish. Quote me on that. The oxtail of fish. One of my favorite lines from one of my favorite movies, Hooper steers the boat, Chief. Yeah, I love that. I love Quid. I love Jaws. I've seen Jaws a million times. Why am I talking about that? I don't know. We're on a boat. I don't know. We're on a boat. We're on the Doro. And we had to do this because we're kind of being tourists, taking a couple of hours off. The Doro runs from the ocean up to the hillside where port's made. So I'm going to connect this narrative to the show. We're going to visit Graham's, which is one of the great port houses. We're going to have a lunch there. and. Later on in this episode, we think, we hope, we're going to be up the Douro, this river, where they actually do 
the trellis vineyards where most of the port wine grapes are grown. So we're on a boat, it's beautiful. Bridges above us. Uh, Porto on that side, Villanova on the other side. And we're headed, what direction are we headed? <laughs> she disappeared. I think we're headed east. That'd be my guess. All right, that's my stand up for this part. Okay, we're off the boat. We're in the city of Porto. We're going to hit the Graham Lodge, get some port history, do a port tasting, and have lunch. We are in at Graham's Lodge. Um, Liz Lodge was built in 1890, but the company was founded in 1820 by two Scottish brothers. In the beginning, the company was mainly port distributors. Then they started to age their own wine, to produce their own wine. They started to acquire uh, Estates in the Douro Valley. Uh, it's a beautiful place. It was declared the World Heritage by it's UNESCO. Gorgeous. It's still difficult to produce wine because of the landscape. Yeah. You have an average of 30% of inclination, so this means that you still have uh, to do 100% of your harvest Finally. manually. Yeah. Uh, you need to hire a lot of people. Then normally, the first winter, the port stays aging uh, in uh, stabilizing in, in, the, in the Douro Valley. Then we bring it here to Villanova de Gaia to start the aging process. Of course, we don't use anymore those old wooden boats. I mean, they used to take boats down the chute. Exactly, it was crazy. Exactly. I mean, it would, it, you'd have barriques stacked up on a little boat it, going down rapids. Was, on a bad day, barriques are flying into the water. <laughs> it used to be. It used to be. I guess the locals on the stream would be rooting for the, the barriques to fall. Probably. Score. <laughs> How much port am I looking at that's being aged in total here? Uh, over here we have uh, 4 million liters of port. Wow, that's huge. Exactly, and it's, it's, it's really important to have that amount of, of, of port when you are preparing your blends. I think at this point, you know what I have to do? Taste. Okay, let's do that. All right, let's, let's do, do a that. tasting. <laughs> Enough talk. So you guys love this vintage. In this wine, you have a strong influence of our iconic varietals. Turiga National and Turiga Franca, these kind of perfumes that are quite unique. This is crazy. So I should wait 15 years and then buy your 11 as a single vintage in the bottle and drink it? I think you should buy it now and, and keep it in your cellar. It's the best way to We have to room in our bags? We'll make room in our bags. Okay. All right, don't let me leave today without we a have, bottle of We have a lot to sell here in Turismo, <laughs> so we are, you are in good hands. This is beautiful. Thanks so, so much. My pleasure. I hope you enjoy Hard not to. So I'm here with the chef. Do you see these sparks? What? I mean, I'm, I'm standing back. Yeah, this is nice. Uh, this is not a station I would want to work. This is really, really hot. So you see this in Spain, you see it all over South America, where you play the piano by raising the ranges up and down over the heat. The heat source is constant and hot. Whew. It's her first day back from vacation, so she's kind of getting acclimated today. Trial by fire, I guess. And Chef, what is, what's, what is this apparai here? What is this? It's a typical uh, soup here in Portugal. It's made with uh, potato? potato, onions, and it's boiled with chorizo, Portuguese chorizo. And then blended? Yeah, blended, and you serve it with, with kale. Super or cabbage, rustic, or super cabbage. rustic heavy, yeah, yeah. beautiful. Yeah, it's heavy. So this is bacalao. Uh, there's a commercial quality, and I know in New York, even as of 10 years ago, that serious chefs that wanted to play with bacalao didn't like the quality of the commercial dried cod. It just, they felt it was, wasn't good. So they started to just salt their own cod. Not so hard to do. And that's why it looks so fresh, so moist like this. Wow, that's pretty. Then at the end, they topped it with this garlic aioli, so garlic-based mayonnaise. Underneath a little salamander to give it some color. It, it smells incredible. It smells like garlic perfume in here classic Portuguese grandma style. You know that has to be delicious. Thank you, chef. <laughs> I'll take it to the table. Table two. We're in the Alta Douro. It's about a two-hour drive up the Douro River, east from the city of Porto. It's one of the oldest wine-growing regions on the planet. They've been growing grapes here for thousands upon thousands of years, and this is where Port was born. As the story goes, the British and the French had a trading relationship for many, many years. We all know that the British invested heavily in Bordeaux and in Cognac. Um, 
However, that relationship was interrupted because the British and the French happened to do battles from time to time, right? Kind of a fractious deal. So the French would raise tariffs and create obstacles. The British had to find new sources. So they sailed south of France, just past the little tip of Spain to the city of Porto, where they found a, a wine there, a red wine made from Vino Verde, that was really interesting. It was big and young and lush, but it had a high sugar content. And as they started to buy that wine and ship it to Britain, some of it arrived great, some of it arrived as vinegar. There was just too much sugar in it. So they begin to do some homework, travel a little further up the Douro, and they found monks in this region growing these grapes. Same trouble with the wine, however. So they knew how to stabilize wine. Second day of fermentation, they would add a wine-based alcohol, shuts the fermentation down, kills the yeast, preserves a high sugar content, but it gets the alcohol to about 20%. It's a stable product. That's how port began. We can go on and on about tawny and vintage and age, but I'm not going to bore you to tears. But that's the story of port. And today we kind of want to explore these vineyards, meet some of the young vignerons, taste some port, and, um, you know, backstage the world of port. This vineyard was planted uh, 107 years ago. And uh, as you can see through the, through the plants, and uh, there we have very, very old uh, vines here. Um, this is a filled land, so... This is what's uh, so interesting. We think of, I think of most vineyards that I've ever been to in my life, it's specific. It's Sangiovese, it's, it's Gamay, it's Pinot Noir, it's Cabernet Sauvignon, and there's the Merlot. Tell us what a field blend means in the, in the High Doro. Well, uh, a field blend is, uh, is always uh, difficult to identify the, the grape varieties because we don't know all of them. <laughs> we are studying, we are studying though. So in this specific vineyard, we have identified 47 different grape varieties so far. And this was typical of the Hydoro, where for years these grapes would become port wine. That was their destiny. Yeah, uh, actually uh, for Quinta do Crasto, we have a long history. We have uh, registers of winemaking uh, since 1615, so long, long time ago. Nowadays, uh, we are very focused in the, also in uh, table wines. And, and those, uh, those dry wines are, are made from uh, some specific old vines. I would say, I don't know, 20 years ago, in the 90s, uh, we start looking around and say, but I mean, this is so beautiful uh, grapes, right. so I mean, this huge potential. Let's start producing also some table wines because I think we can do. Uh, we can also produce outstanding wines with, with this raw material. Talk about uh, one of the other things that's fascinating about this area and is so germane to wine period is soil typicity. And people talk about schist and what is schist and, well, if you want to know what schist is, we're just going to pick up a few pieces here. I mean, this is... <laughs> Look at this. That's just yeah. yeah. We are standing in a very, very poor soil. So the, the average uh, yield of a vine is very, very low. Here is below 200 grams per, per vine, which is nothing. That's nothing. But the quality is fantastic. We're here at Quinto do Casto. Crasto. Crasto. <laughs> I can't speak Portuguese. The chef, who does not want to be on microphone, her name is? Filipa. Filipa, she's great. I'm s sitting outside and the w this is a little home kitchen, really. And the smell is coming out and it reminds me of my grandmother. That's what... This food. that we are doing a great job. And I, I gotta go in the kitchen. I gotta go in the kitchen and see what she's doing. So well, this was not a planned thing. We bum rushing her. She's frying up some fish. Walk me through what we're gonna have here. So this is little... We will taste this for the aperitifs. This is a very uh, typical Portuguese sausage, but instead of pork right. meat, you have white meat, like chicken, turkey, and bread. Here we've got some octopus that's we been boiled octopus, already. Um, and she already cooked cool. it, she already boiled it. Right. That's some more octopus. That is more octopus, yes. Uh, that she just cut it, and then she will fry it, pan it, you know. Like right, like egg bread, egg, egg and bread. And bread mm -hmm. How much garlic? This much, a lot. A lot. And dry, do we know what that herb is? Um, we call it uh, oregano. Oregano. Yes, yeah, so oregano. It's the same, right? All right, she ain't shy with the spices. We're, we're rolling here. And that's it. Nice lunch with the Douro boys. Now let's head up the road to Sandman, another famous port house. And guess what? Another port tasting. I mentioned this to another port wine producer the other day. I think that these two, the 10 and the 20, would make interesting wines for certain food pairings. Food pairings, that's yes, right. Yes. I think, rather yes, than yes, just yes, relegating yes, them I, to cheese yes, or yes, chocolate yes, desserts, yes. I think that with certain spice combinations, curries, blends, certain types of meat, pork, for example, yes. this would be a beautiful accompaniment yes, with a meal. Be, yes. Okay, so he agrees it's with me, thank goodness.
If you disagreed, I'd be crushed. N n but not with lamprey. We have here. Not with, no, 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 with no, no, lamprey. No, yeah. not with we, lamprey. We'll If all the wine we drink for the rest of our lives has something as good as this, we will be okay. Can't come to Portugal and not talk about cork. We're at Amarinho, which is the biggest cork producer on the planet. Number one in Portugal, number one in the world. We're gonna go in here and see how they turn a big hunk of bark into something that holds your wine secure, your bourbon neat and tidy, and maybe your fancy shoes. This is the best paid job on the shop floor. What they're doing goes directly to the bottom line of the company. He decides when to punch and where to punch. There are robots that can do this for less expensive. Yes. But these are the corks. These are the wines corks that I want to drink. That, exactly, I was going to say that. This is not wasted. We're Never. going to grind this and make the shanks for the technical stoppers and the champagne stoppers. Uh, because here, even the dust from the operation gets used. It gets used. 63% of our energy needs comes from the burning of cork dust, which is a zero emission fuel. So, very, very green on the outside and very green on the inside. This is what comes off it. I mean, this is, that's the bark. That's a bark. That's the inside. They get stripped off the trees, cut into sections. They come here. And you were pointing out completely correctly that even within this pile, we have some that are tight, and then we have guys like this that are gonna become a shoe. The fact is that cork has been used in uh, footwear since the Roman. And if you think of it, the difference between a pair of $1,200 design high heels today and a pair of um, Roman sandals is not that different. <laughs> it's a base of cork with some leather stripes on top of it, um, except the heel. The heel, the the heel, heel got a little right. bit bigger, yeah. That's, that's right. right. The cork business is 1% of the GDP of the country. Yeah. The, the, the men, I'm assuming most of them, who remove the cork from the trees, that labor, are making 100, almost 100 euros a day. Almost 100 euros One a day. One of the best paying jobs there is for almost in, in anything. Agricultural, in agricultural agriculture, terms, yes, absolutely. And absolutely. often it's a couple of people from the same family working oh, those more. same months. I, I've seen three generations working on the same oak. This tree has been harvested for the first time. It's called virgin cork. But if you progress, then the tree is going to be a lot more like that, much where you can tell the difference between one and the other. Quality control really is amazing here. In part, it's a reaction to the famous late 90s corked wine issues and an extremely obscure chemical compound called TCA. Talk to me about the tests that you're using to assure that corks coming out of your facilities are TCA free. Every single one of the four billion corks that, uh, that we do comes from a lot that it was tested simply using the world's most sophisticated chemical analysis there is. And this is gas chromatography, and we use that 14,000 uh, times a month that we do uh, this kind of screening, this kind of testing. It's very, very expensive. The machines are very sophisticated. The know-how that you need to have to implement it to do this kind of quality control is huge, um, but that was the challenge. Okay, so I was in Portugal a year ago and came to this restaurant, docked over the Douro. It's like literally built on pilings over the river. Uh, it's amazing. Chef's in Brazil right now. He's a cool guy. We've got his sous chef here. I think we're in able hands because the truth is sous chefs run most kitchens and she's a she. Congratulations, Natalia. So, a couple of demos we're going to do. We'll probably film a little bit of service. First dish is a cod dish. We, cod and Portuguese cuisine are like integral. They do a million things with cods. It's kind of a cod soup. So what they've made is they've made a broth with the usual suspects, potato, onions, sweated down, a broth from the, from the cod that was salted. This is salt cod, kind of like a fritter, but it's wrapped in that little Greek pastry that's super crunchy, super crispy, super textural. Julienne red pepper, green pepper, no skin. Obviously the broth is gonna go around it, so we've got this wonderful bacalao broth. Oh, that looks pretty silky. So a modern take on classic Portuguese cuisine. Uh-oh, she's adding something else here. What's that? Vinegar? Black olive oil. Black olive oil. Hard work? Hard work, hard work. How do you say hard work in Portuguese? Si. <laughs> hard work, I got my answer. All right, we'll have a bite of the soup. That's God. That's good. That's good. <laughs> And I just have to do this. I shouldn't because I'm going to eat dinner later, but you know what I mean. This is how we go. Mm. Mm. 
<laughs> Got it. What am I looking at here, you know? Crispy creme brulee. Crispy creme brulee. Yeah. Orange and ice cream. And then some melons. Yes, mango. Some fresh fruit, some mango, mango purees. Yes. Chef, chef. In your best English. What is it? Rieke. Sponge cake. Sponge cake. Yes. Okay. All right, this is an apple puree. Yes. Zucchini stuffed with another apple puree, but a different apple puree. With pre sprouts and lots of pickled vegetables. We're going to get some tartness in there, and then that crunch from the croquant thing they're calling earth, which is a bread that they've crisped. Neck, neck, pork. Uh, pork neck. neck. Yes. Yeah, everyone loves neck. 12 hours slow cooked sea vap, like butter. You don't even do you, you need a spoon to eat this, basically. And the jus, which is going to be yeah. the cooking liquid that they braised it in. The juice from the neck, full of flavor. All right, spin the plate. Got to dig into this bad boy. Let's go into this end. I really didn't need the knife. That's good. That's good. Come to New York and open a restaurant. You'll join a bunch of great women chefs in New York City if you come. We'll help you with a visa. I know you have no idea what I'm saying. Sorry about that. I don't speak Portuguese, you don't speak English. But anyway, great job. We're gonna go eat dinner tonight. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. So we spent about a day and a half up the Douro drinking port and all those wonderful wines. Now we've driven almost to the coast. We're in Bairada, which is a coastal region, about 20 kilometers from the coast. Interesting place, famous for a couple of things. One of them is roast suckling pig, a specialty here. They eat it all year round, cooked in those kind of like pizza ovens. We're gonna have a suckling pig for lunch. Before lunch, we're gonna have a tasting with sparkling wines. Often we just drink sparkling wines as a toaster and aperitif. No, they work with salumi, they work with cheese, they work with anything fried, um, and they work with suckling pig. So a little sparkling wine tasting with this wonderful chalk-based soil, and then suckling pig with a bunch of vigneron. How can we go wrong with this? But Pigs not... arrived. And suckling pig, is it seasonal or do you eat it almost all year long? All oh, year. That's what I thought, because this area is no famous for suckling yes. pig. Yes. And the sparkling wine is perfect pairing. Yes. If you go to a restaurant here in the area, you'll see half of the tables with sparkling wine on the table and uh, the suckling pig is very, very good. Not bad. So the ocean is 12 miles away. You've got vineyards here with sparkling wine. You eat great suckling pigs. Life is good. <laughs> Life is good, yeah. <laughs> Good simple life, man, I, you know? <laughs> Come on, America. <laughs> so he's got the oven temperature exactly where he wants it. He's moved all the wood off to the side. He's using spent ash to basically cover the flame that exists to, to just hold that temperature and slow down the fire. He goes porky. He's going to watch it now. So he's got the ashes in, he's got the pig in. This is like the critical time. The first 20 minutes is super critical because you want crisp skin. Huge, right? The skin's gonna blister, he's gonna pop the blisters. He wants the skin completely crisp, but not burnt. And then we're gonna shut that door and just let this thing cook for probably 90 minutes. Okay, while I wait for the pig to cook, let's go visit a sparkling wine cellar. I really love the sparkling wines from Biagada. Chalk soil, great grapes, and classic method champignoise style. This particular style here, you see this all over Champagne. This is, and anywhere where you're making sparkling wines, this is how they're stored. These wines still have yeast in them. Have to be stored this way, have to be turned. All this is done manually. Of course, in the big places they do it by machine. Here it's still all done by hand. Traditional, old school, has to be racked like this. Sometimes we have 6,000 bottles here. I've done it once or twice, just alone. It took me about an hour. No way. 6,000 bottles, so, you've turned like that in an hour. A little bit of practice <laughs> so many years. You're a good man. Another varietal that I don't know. I mean, this is so much fun to be, it's kind of like walking someplace you've never been before again and again and again with all these grapes. But that's, that's the most beautiful thing about Portugal. You know, because you can find such a diverse of varieties of landscapes, of culture, of gastronomic. Um, and we are yeah. such a little country. Yeah, 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 yeah. The good thing about sparkling wines in Portugal, I think, is that uh, finally uh, the consumers in Portugal found out that you can drink sparkling 
throughout the meal. You know, the popularity of cava, prosecco blew up yeah. in America. Yeah. You know, and that's a, it's okay, but it's stainless steel tanks, it's a different style. Yeah. This is a little more artisan than a lot of what Prosecco's coming out of. Um, the price point on, on for your entry levels is the same. This is just great stuff. And Americans are, I think, drinking more and more sparkling wines. And this is your glass. Yeah. Wow. We love to make wine for food, so that, we need wine, this. Uh, wine is for food, period. Yeah. And you're the winemaker now? You're the next generation? Yes. Congratulations. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Love to see it. All right, time for pig. Pig time. Yep. All right. All right. It's been an hour and a half. The pig yes. is totally ready. Here we go. Oh, that's beautiful. Inside it is about uh, 99 degrees Celsius degrees. So I'm gonna go fast. Um, cut in. Yep. Now. Go. Okay. Yep. So the head, it's already cooked. Yep. You want to test? Thank you so much, Chef. We're talking about super crisp skin. It's like <laughs> ceramic in this beautiful fatty piece of flesh. That's the sound we want. Perfection. The best in Vaidata? The best? One of the best. Thank you, Chef. Okay, folks, sorry, we're out of time. Stay tuned next week for part two. We'll spend a morning surfing the beach breaks at Cascais, then off to more Michelin food and some great wine. You know, the good life in Portugal. Cheers. My Colomeco's Real Food is brought to you by the continuous, generous support of the following underwriters. Cola Vita, a true Italian. Imported from Italy, Anna Pasta is made from 100% Italian Durham wheat semolina and pure spring water, slowly dried to cook al dente. Recipes online at cento.com. La Balen Sea Salt, naturally crystallized by the Mediterranean sun and wind on the coast of France. A heritage preserved over centuries with passion, craftsmanship, and care. The flavor of European pork and beef. The taste of European tradition. From Welshire Farms comes Lou's Garrett Valley Naturals, a collection of our recipes made from minimal ingredients without added antibiotics, hormones, nitrates, nitrites, or artificial ingredients. Lou's Garrett Valley Naturals. Rachel Ray's signature specialty food line, from her all-natural extra virgin olive oils and balsamic vinegars to her stock in a box, designed for preparing meals at home.